You're listening to Accounted For, the Canadian podcast that explores the intangibles of every career. I'm your host, Daniel Lee. Hello. Happy Wednesday, everyone. Welcome back to Accounted For. The podcast is part of OMD Ventures, my platform to create ecosystems so that high performers are inspired to challenge the conventions. On top of the podcast, the platform has a weekly essay and newsletter that includes my daily learnings from the week. So subscribe to the weekly newsletter at omdventures.com slash stakeholder, and you'll be able to keep up to date with everything. And if you'd like to help out more, please uh, donate to helping out the platform by buying me a cup of coffee. You can buy me a copy of my a cup of coffee a month, a week, a week, or even on a daily basis. And all this stuff would really help with growing the platform. And so if you'd also just like to learn more about what I do and why I'm doing all this, just check out omdventures.com as well. Okay, so today's guest is Nadim Nathu. He is the co-founder and executive director at TKS, and that stands for The Knowledge Society. The Knowledge Society is an education company that works with 13 to 17 year olds to really mine human potential to make unicorn people. From cold emailing his way into an internship with Nobel Peace Prize winner Muhammad Yunus at Grameen Bank at the age of 19 to being a part of the first cohort of the next 36 entrepreneur group and then even like traveling throughout Africa at a young age, entrepreneurship and social impact was a major part of Nadim's growth. And after working as a consultant at McKinsey, Nadim plunged into the world of entrepreneurship by joining up with his brother in San Francisco. It would be a hypothetical question of what they would do with $10 billion that really propelled the creation of TKS back in their hometown in Calgary. Nadim and his brother created a company that really combined their love for learning as well as exponential technology. And it's a journey I've had a lot of fun learning about and is something that I think you'd all be very fascinated by as well. And not just the journey itself, but just the way I think Nadim thinks about solving various problems as well as how he goes about even deciding to solve major issues in the world and the kind of vast goal and dream that him and his brother have, I think was very admirable and exciting for me to learn about. And so, yeah, I think this will be a conversation that will really expand your perspectives and really have you question the default and maybe inspire you to action as well. So please enjoy my chat with Nadim. Hey everyone, welcome back to Accounted For. Today on the podcast, we have Nadim Nathu. Hey Nadim, thanks for coming on the podcast. Nadim here is the co-founder and executive director at TKS, which stands for the Knowledge Society. And so Nadim, for our audience members who might not be familiar with TKS, What does the company do? Can you describe it, please? Well, the mission of TKS is we wanted to completely rethink the way young people learn and develop globally, right? And so we wanted to provide training on knowledge, skills, mindsets, and networks that young people need to eventually solve really important problems in the world. And what this has translated to is a nine to 10 month pretty intensive program where these kids come in, get exposed to a lot of exponential technologies, ways of thinking uh, and, and mindsets and skills like communication, collaboration, all that stuff to eventually go on and do some really incredible things. And, you know, so far seeing phenomenal outcomes that I don't think we're seeing anywhere else in the world at scale. Like our kids are getting invited to speak at conferences in front of thousands of people all over the world, like Web Summit, South by Southwest, CES. Two weeks ago, one of our girls uh, got invited to speak at Microsoft's global or international conference in front of 30,000 people, standing ovation. People were crying next to me. We got to hang out with Satya after. Uh, and he was like, man, I can definitely see why I didn't even get a standing ovation and she got a standing ovation, right? So there's things like that. But, you know, getting internships at Microsoft, IBM, as young as 14, 15 years old uh, and leading startups in the region, which we haven't really seen. Um, but more importantly, getting recognized based on the projects that they're working on. Things like AI, quantum computing, nanotech, gene editing, blockchain. I mean, I was telling you earlier, one of our students built a ring that can non-invasively measure blood glucose and cholesterol levels without penetrating the skin. It's like real-time monitoring of heart disease and diabetes, the holy grail of biometrics. And somehow this 18, 19-year-old kid cracked it, right? And has an international patent and all that stuff. It's really not cute. One of our girls cured muscular dystrophy in mice at 14 years old. And now they're on human trials casually, right, at 14. Um, did some stuff in blockchain, which was really awesome. And now she's a brain-computer interface developer. So she's figured out a way to control prosthetic limbs with your mind. And electric cars, and music, 
Um, another one of our students was recently named one of the top 10 VR influencers in the world um, and built some really awesome uh, product for indoor navigation using augmented reality and computer vision um, that you know may or may not have something good to do with with Google that might happen, uh, but he's 15 years old. And when he joined at 13, he didn't even know what VR was. And so for us is how can we mine human potential, right? Everybody has potential. Um, and, you know, depending on where you're born and what you're exposed to and all that stuff, it's how can we maximize the probability of people actually reaching that potential? And, and that's kind of our goal at TKS is, you know, how can we do that for people everywhere? Mm -hmm. And right now the, the program targets uh, students who are aged between 13 to 17. Exactly. Right? And it's a weekend program that goes on for nine months for yep. three years. For yeah, for three in. years. So the the three year programs are very different, and not everyone is going to be the right fit when they come back. But the first year program is all about. So we say at TKS, you have two major priorities. Okay, forget about all the nitty gritty stuff. The first is get a better understanding of yourself, and the second, uh, the first is get a better understanding of yourself. The second is get a better understanding of the world. Once you do those two things, we think you'll be able to hack life. Right. And so the first year program is all about, you know, figuring out what you're excited about or developing your passion, um, building your portfolio and your skills and all that. The second year program is all about getting a better understanding of the world, problems, industries. One of the things that I see, and especially when I was down, down in Silicon Valley, is there's a lot of smart people, but they're working on things like Uber for bartenders. Right. Or this one guy who started this computer vision algorithm to detect how fast a dog was wagging their tail so they can make like a Yelp for dog food. And for me, I'm like, man, you could literally be curing cancer right now, but it's not their fault because that's the problem that they deeply feel. Whereas if you go out on the street right now and you ask the average person, what are the top three problems facing our civilization? They might say climate change. They might say hunger. They might say poverty. Those aren't problems, though. Those are outcomes. People are hungry. People are poor. The climate is changing. Why are people hungry? Why are people poor? Why is the climate changing? And if you don't have a really deep understanding of these problems, it's almost impossible, regardless of how smart you are, to actually try and tackle it. So that's what the second year program is all about. It's going really deep and understanding like very obscure, multi-billion dollar important problems like lab testing or like shipping tracking, like all that stuff. And then the third year program is all about how can you build world class product, like literally world class product. Because you could know, you know, you could be the smartest person in the world. You can identify um, the problems, but most people don't even know where to start. How do you go about building? How do you go about creating? Um, and so in that sense, it turns into a little bit more of a, an accelerator. Um, but starting from the problem, like really a deep understanding of the problem, because the solution will change. You can always iterate the solution, but the problem will more often than not always be there until it's addressed by somebody else. That's mm -hmm. kind of what it looks like. Gotcha. And I think in a past interview, you talked about how, um, I'm going to paraphrase what you said, where I think you noted two potential reasons why some young entrepreneurs might have suboptimal impact results, one being uh, the ambition level being much smaller, like focusing on dog tail waggings, or, and the second uh, being the innate desire to fit a solution into a problem instead of trying to actually identify a problem and then trying to figure out how to pro solve it from there and just kind of coming in with, I already have an answer, where's a problem I can solve with this answer? So given those kinds of... Um, two points how do you kind of create this kind of mentality in, into your students where they can think in really way more like viciously and they're, they're not trying to solve like little problems like trying to create like the next uber of xyz and or just saying this is what i want to do where's this problem that i can find but actually yeah. being very curious to de like really get you know into a problem go down a rabbit hole yeah so for the second one i really think you solve that by training first principles thinking mm -hmm. right instead of fitting you know a solution to a problem like that is definitely not first principles thinking right mm -hmm. like if aliens came down to the world they saw the state of whatever it is that you're looking at you know what would be the and given all our technologies and resources and all that stuff how would we go about building the optimal solution um so i think that one addresses the second point um, to the first one, it goes back to, again, deeply understanding these problems in the world, right? We ask on average, so, you know, the 13 or 14 year olds who come into the program, we did this two years ago, a very anecdotal, small sample size, but we asked them, name all the careers you could possibly name, right? How many careers on average do you think a 13 or 14 year old could name? What do you think? Probably about seven, seven, seven? to ten. Okay, so you're a little bit more pessimistic. Uh, it was 13, uh, but that's including janitor, firefighter, doctor, nurse, like, right? And they can only name 13. So if you only know 13 things, it's almost, it's virtually impossible in your head to conceive of being something different. Now, similarly to problems, when you're an entrepreneur and you're solving a problem, is if you don't have a really good understanding of the world, 
the problem that you feel is this Uber for bartender problem or like, I don't know what's the best pet food to buy, right? And for me, I think what was a really interesting experience, and I think that this is a really defining factor of my life is growing up, I was very fortunate to actually get a good understanding of the world. I spent some time in India and East Africa. And when, whenever my parents would go on to trips, we went to Greece one day and you know, all my friends got really excited. And I think I was like 14, 15 years old and they made us sit in a school. And we were taking public transportation everywhere. Like it was definitely not a vacation, right? And at the time, you kind of almost resent it because you're like, what kind of vacation or trip is this? But now we have a deep understanding of what people are actually like and these places are actually like and cultures there. I spent some time in Tajikistan building early childhood development centers or teaching a uh, business case course at uh, a university in Mombasa. Or I worked with Mohamed Yunus, who's the Nobel Peace Prize winner. Um, and founder of microfinance at the Grameen Bank when I was 19 years old. And I got to live in these villages and in Dhaka, uh, which is the capital, for over two months, figuring out how we can increase repayment rates. And I saw some, I saw some stuff, man, like people, I saw some people die uh, or just fall off uh, from a construction site and just being swooped away and then putting someone else on. Like it was just very casual. And so I think what's really important to understand is our reality that we see here and not, and not to like go down this like super philosophical philosophical thing, but it's really true. The Western reality is not the reality. This is a bubble, right? If you think about all of Canada and the US, that's 400 million people, maybe Japan, like 100 million people. And then you have Western Europe, say maximum a billion people, every other country. And then Australia, and there's like a couple of random countries here. Every other country is still developing, right? And so once you deeply understand what's happening everywhere else, you're not thinking about Uber for bartenders anymore, right? Because again, every entrepreneur is just trying to solve a problem. Um, but when there's other problems that in your head fit into an order of magnitude or importance, um, you got to start with those first. And for us, education was one of those. Uh, health was definitely another. And then, you know, affordable housing and food production, like those kind of things fit in there. That's our level of thinking right now. But the first step is really getting exposed to those things. Yeah, I think um, you, you put it extremely well. And the quote that comes to my mind is um, from Professor Dan Gilbert from Harvard. He's a psychologist there. And he talks about how human imagination is limited by our own experience and our own perception. And so the only way to expand imagination is to experience more and actually get more knowledge of a wider array of things instead of just staying in this kind of narrow bend of things. For sure. And, and the way that we're programmed as people, like biologically programmed, is we only care about whatever's in our immediate monkey sphere. Like we know a bunch of crazy stuff is happening all over the world. People are dying every single day from famine or, you know, there's wars happening, but we don't like, it's kind of out of sight or out of mind. Like we see it on the news and we're like, oh damn, that, that sucks for a second. And then we keep going. Whereas the reality is, is like those people are living it, right? It's really it's really different seeing, you know, on a movie, in a violent movie, maybe John Wick or something, someone gets shot and you're like, man, that's badass. If you saw that in person, you would be like, holy crap. Like there is no way you would have the same reaction. And the question that I often ask people is like, say you were walking to work, right? And you had a phone, you had a nice phone, nice watch. Was it waterproof? You're wearing nice clothes, whatever. And you see this kid who's playing in a fountain, like one of those like wishing well fountains and they see like a dollar inside. And they're trying to reach in for the dollar and they fall in the fountain. And they're about to drown. And no one else is around. Do you save them? And keep in mind, if you try and save them, all your stuff is going to get ruined. So like this thousand dollars that you have on you is, is gone. Like what would you do? Oh, I'd, I'd jump in and save them. you jump in and save them. Like right. you wouldn't even really think about it, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so second day, you, and you tell all your friends, like, man, that was a crazy experience. So the second day, you get up, you get your new watch, you get your new phone, feel kind of good about yourself you saved a life you're on your way to work you see the same kid playing in the fountain falls in the fountain nobody else around what do you do gotta go in again gotta go in it again right and then maybe you like spank him on the butt a little bit but like hey stop playing in this <laughs> fountain right um you're like please like really stop doing that okay you go off the third day you get your new phone your new watch or whatever the same damn kid Playing in the fountain, about to fall in, drown. What do you do? Go in again. But I think at that at that point, though, like I would have said, like the second time, it's kind of like you want to teach a man how to fish, right? Kind of teaching the kid why they shouldn't do this and why the the result and the consequences of if I wasn't there, this could happen to you. And like this is 
I, I wouldn't be the guy, kind of guy that gets these thousand dollar watches. But there's also the idea of why don't you change your own behavior pattern where this won't even matter. Absolutely. And, and you can tell someone to do that, but say they still do it. You still go and save that guy. And at this point, you're shutting down the fountain. You're going to the city. <laughs> you're like, we need to take out water. Why is this fountain so deep that a kid can drown in this fountain? Like you really focus on the infrastructure. There's two main points that I'm trying to make is we know people are dying every single day from preventable disease, like lack of HIV drugs or hunger or fat or, or, um, or, or, or water or things like that. But we don't do anything about it, right? We don't really do. We know, but because we're not seeing it, because we're not seeing it, we don't feel like we can have an immediate impact. We don't do it. And so we tend to focus on other things. Whereas, you know, I've been, and I really consider myself fortunate in this instance where I've actually seen it and I have felt it. And when you see it or feel it, it's almost like if you can really empathize with me in that example <clears throat> to you, there's a no brainer. You'd go in and save that kid, right? Mm -hmm. To me, that's the same level of conviction I feel about solving these problems. To me, it's a no brainer. It's not even like, oh, what do you want to do with your time or whatever? Like you don't have a choice. It's your duty. So when I think about building TKS to solve really important problems, it's not really a choice. Like I'm like, man, I really got to go in and like pull this kid out of the fountain because I believe that I can actually do it. It's a no brainer for me. I, it's almost as clear as like this person is drowning in the water and I can just take a couple steps and take them out just as clear as that and just how easy it is that sounds to you like that's and it's not going to be easy but that's the way i feel about you know potentially solving these really hard problems that the world is facing that's the first thing and then the second thing is working on this infrastructure problem like why is the fountain so you know filled with water in the first place like how can we like a lot of these dumb things in the world that are really just infrastructure problems that we can fix and you know part of that is like the education system i personally think and i hope no one gets offended because I'm not targeting teachers or principals and all that stuff. They're kind of just playing in the system. It's kind of whoever just developed the system. In my opinion, is like 5 to 10% optimal. Um, and there's like a lot of low-hanging fruit. If we think about, like, do we think collaboration is good? I think so. Do we think problem solving is good? Yes. Do we think courage is good and confidence and, you know, being able to deal with ambiguity? All that stuff is good. We're actually not training any of that, being resourceful. We're not training any of that in school. Right? It's, it's actually the opposite, right? We... We don't encourage people to take risks. Uh, there is not a lot of amb ambiguity. It's like whatever you learn is what you learn. Um, there's not in increasing your risk profile because you typically get rec reprimanded for you know going outside the lines. It's very competitive. It's not collaborative. You're not taught how to problem solve. Just memorize. My whole point is like it's such a low-hanging fruit solution. You don't even need to pull this kid out of the water. Just reduce the water, right? And so for me, like when those two things kind of b combine together, it's like a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. And the, in you know, you're attacking this huge problem right now and you talked about how you know you got to experience a lot of the world when you were young and see a lot of what was out there and actually learn to actually be able to empathize by going through this experience and gaining these perspectives but when you grew up you you were born in calgary and i had the chance to work in calgary for a short period and you know it's a i, I felt it was kind of a one-dimensional city it's very focused oil on gas town. oil and gas town kind of a boom and bust cycle there like i went after the oil bust happened and so it was very much like a ghost town but people tell me about the glory days and so i'm wondering when you you know when as you were growing up in calgary like what what was your like kind of childhood like was it did you have parents that like, kept on emphasizing like learning about the world trying to like expose you guys constantly through these trips to different things yeah so honestly when you're young this is what i think like if you're not uh suffering or whatever, if you're not in a position where you got to like think about, which I'm again fortunate that I wasn't, where I'm thinking about like where my next meal is coming from, you actually don't think about the city that much. First of all, you don't know what the alternative was. You're just like, man, I kind of live here in a suburb. I go to school, I go to my extracurriculars, and I go home. There's no like downtown life. There's like, you just go over to your friend's house, you have a sleepover, right? So for me, it was just like, oh, I was just a kid uh, and realized actually to the extent that um, I was very fortunate. Um, so that that was one. And, and part of it is my parents were immigrants, right? They did got kicked. So my mom lived in Uganda. My dad lived in Tanzania. They got kicked out of East Africa during like the whole Idi Amin time or in Tanzania where they were nationalizing property. My dad has a grade nine education. Couldn't help me with homework or any of that stuff. So, you know, and, and they would always just be like, you good? You getting good grades? Whatever you chill. So to, you know, in that sense, you know, there were some times where I was like, man, like these guys can't even really helped me with anything like that's kind of frustrating but it was really important because i had to figure a lot of the stuff up, up, up by myself but what was really good about them is they were hyper encouraging 
Um, and going back to the theme of exposure, um, I had tons of exposure. My mom was like, do gymnastics, do piano, go, go into uh, basketball, go to a Christian camp, sit in a gurudwara. Like literally she's like, do everything and just figure out your own life. So there's a lot of autonomy given there. I remember when I was like 12, um, no, it was, it was younger than that. It was like eight. I had to take the bus and I'd never taken the bus. And normally I had to meet my mom at this one place in the mall and, there's like a payphone there, whatever. So I call and uh, she's like, oh, just take the, like casually. She's like, oh, just take the bus home. It's like, okay. Like I'd never taken the bus before and I just had to figure it out. And guess what? I got home and I was okay. And my mom was like, yeah, because this is what literally we were doing in East Africa and everyone's fine. Right. So I think we're moving into a little bit of a conversation about, you know, people being overly sheltered. But I think I was, I was very fortunate where I had a good childhood, like no real tragedy or anything like that, but also the level of exposure and openness for my parents to like give me the autonomy to be the CEO of my own life. I think most young people are employees of their own life and their parents are the CEOs. Whereas I think we need to move it such that people are the CEO of their own life and they're maybe parents or mentors or whatever, or their friends are on like their board of directors. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. if we can make that switch as early as possible, then we start to develop this accountability that compounds throughout our life and then we generate confidence and conviction and ideas and things and courage to be able to go out and do stuff whereas if you're sheltered and you're always like doing what other people told you it's very difficult from like now in an entrepreneurial context to have enough courage to be like hey this is what i'm going to do because you're always looking for people for answers whereas if you've been doing it making decisions ever since you were a young age and it's been going well and you get a lot of these positive signs it's like i'm just going to do it again except solve this problem instead of figuring out what i'm going to eat for lunch right yeah i think um there's a there's a kind of startup coach slash guru who um, also founded Flatiron Ventures called Jerry Colonna, and he talks about how there's a you, when you actually examine a lot of the earlier lives of young entrepreneurs, you realize that a lot of them are forced into situations where they had to grow up early, where they had to be CEOs of their own lives, whether it's coming from a broken family or they were just given a lot of independence when they were young, and parents allowed that kind of things to happen. And for you, as you were kind of growing up, and you know. You talked about that period where you took the bus for the first time. like, And you also now work with teenagers from age 13 to 17. When you were young, like maybe ages 8 to 12, 7 to 13, what was the kind of kind of dream career that you had? Like, What did you think that you'd grow up doing when you, you know, you're exposed to so many things? You're now, you know, becoming the owner of your own destiny. Like, what, what did you think you'd be doing? No, I was thinking, like, I'm thinking about it now. And like, what did I actually feel like? So I was a very chubby kid. I was introverted, didn't have a lot of friends. My brother was actually the popular one. If you meet us now, um, it's completely different. You'd be like, what, Naveed was the, you know, popular. He's like the one who's more introverted now, doesn't really like to go out to meetings. And and I'm the one kind of everywhere. But it's really interesting because I had, I, I think I always had this innate ambition and it wasn't a position I didn't I actually didn't know when I made my university decision now we're talking about like when I was 17 18 um like I, I'd done well in school and I was always ambitious that's so I was volunteering and I was helping people and I was doing all that stuff but I had no idea what it was for and this is evidence of that when I made my university decision I was like oh my brother's going to western he has a car we fit into the same clothes and I don't like shopping I guess I'll go to western like that's the decision making framework and I was like one of the most ambitious young people. Imagine all these other people, like what decision framework did they use, right? And I actually find it's it's not that much better today. Um, but I remember when I was like eight or nine years old, I was just like, I wanted to do something bigger. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know what. Uh, and I was always curious. I did work hard. Um, but then I think as life went on, I figured out why I was ambitious. I think that was that's the most important flip. Like, why am I doing all this stuff and what is it for? Like, you know, this whole like existential purpose and stuff discussion. We don't necessarily need to go into that on the podcast. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, I think every decision that people make innately, they do because they think they're going to be better off or happier after their decision. Um, And I don't think we're really thoughtful about that until we develop a level of self-awareness or self-agency to be like, like why am I making these decisions what do I want to get out of it as soon as you're like a little bit thoughtful I think your whole decision making framework changes yeah I think Mark Twain has a quote that I'm also going to paraphrase where he says I think he says something about how life is in two stages the first stage is when you're born and the second stage is when you figure out why and I'd actually like to like to go into the inflection point in your life like was it a particular moment or was it an experience like 
for me, I, I had my relatively recently where I ended up leaving the hedge fund world back in last year in March, and that's when I kind of had my own flip. But I'm curious for you, how did yours kind of bring about? I think for me, it was when I was working at the Grameen Bank in Bangladesh. Mm-hmm. So this is after my first year in university. Everyone wanted to try and get a job somewhere and like consulting or because they wanted to get set up for the second year, to be set up for the third year, to be set up for the fourth year. And I'm like, man, I just want to be interesting. And microfinance was a thing that I just heard of. And I joined some random microfinance club. And someone brought up Grameen Bank was the best organization in the world for microfinance. So I'm like literally emailing Muhammad Yunus, right? Classic, like just, you know, email him three, four, five times. And he's like, finally, okay, you can come down. And I was like, well, can you pay for my flight? They're like, mm, okay, yeah, fine. And then I was like, can you pay for my hotel? They're like, okay, fine, but that's it. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and then Whoa, we were- take me back. How, how'd you convince a Nobel Peace Prize winning person to first answer your email and then continuously you know agree to bring you down <laughs> I, I just said i was, I was just, like I'm, th- I'm this kid i'm really interested in my microfinance i'm studying business kind of embellish myself a little bit uh-huh. right i was like oh i'm a business student um i think i can come help uh I'm, I'm happy to come down for free or whatever uh and then it was typing in different emails and i found this other uh this other guy who worked at green bank so i was just cc'ing as many people and i actually still have that strategy today when i reach out to someone um, I make sure to CC a couple people because then someone else is thinking, oh, did this person respond to their message? Whereas if you only send an email to someone like one-on-one, they can choose to ignore it. Whereas other people are CC'd, everyone's thinking like, okay, who's going to respond to this email? It's still in my inbox, whatever, right? So um, it's it's weird that I had that innate thing, but kind of just did that a couple of times until the guy who was CC'd on my email responded with Muhammad Yunus being like, okay, yeah, we're we can consider doing this. Can you come for X time to X time? I was like, yeah, sure. And then I was like, can you pay for this? Can you pay for that? And then my brother and I actually both went down. Um, But it was there at the Grameen Bank and really seeing like the state of people in the world. Dhaka was one of the most densely populated cities in the world. There's a thousand people per square kilometer. So every meter, there's someone at all times of day, right? Um, and there were people, you know, who had health issues and there was arsenic in the water. So I remember when we woke up, you had to check if there was bed bugs and you just had to like if there was blood spots on the bed. And th- that was just a reality. And then you go into the bathroom and you wash all the cockroaches off the wall. You had to listen to the radio to see if there, you could take a shower today because there's arsenic in the water. You can't really eat a lot of food because there's arsenic in the water. And so if they're not using proper water, so I was, my diet was like a bottle of Coke and Lay's this like spicy lemon or whatever ketchup chips for like the longest time until I figured out they had a Nando's there. And I was like, man, we're eating a Nando's every day. And that was like a month and a half in. So we only had like two weeks of Nando's and it was like one meal a day, but it was really far away. Um, but for me, I was like, man, my purpose here is like, look, okay, I'm living in this village and crazy stories, right? Like living in this village and I'm looking up and I'm, there's this tarantula. It's 40 degrees, like right above me. And there's a bunch of mosquitoes, but the mosquito net's not working. And I'm literally, you know, lying there on a plank of wood. And then at the other side of the room, there was a lizard. And the only hope, like I was daydreaming, like maybe the lizard will like eat this tarantula. And I'm just staying up all night. And eventually like it fade and I open my eyes and it's gone. But I realized at that moment, I was like, man, this is what people are like. This is how people are living every single day. I'm so, to me, I think gratitude is the highest form of happiness or one of the highest forms of happiness and the self-actualization self-actualization all that stuff but to be able to give back to someone you're pretty much saying my life is so good that i can just help other people and so whenever you're doing that when i talked about making decisions right every decision that you make you think you're going to be happy and if that's like the highest unit of happiness then just always make decisions to help other people right um you know we talk about we hear all these podcasts of very successful people and they make a lot of money. Like every single person who makes a lot of money virtually, um, who you would respect, what are they doing with it? Like whoever's listening, I, they're probably giving it away. So what was it? And they're giving it away for what? Um, to solve problems that alleviate people's suffering, right? Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. <clears throat> most most of their focus on health and education. The Zuck Chen Foundation, most of their focus on health and education, right? It's like, it's not really a secret. And so what if you could just do that day one? What if you don't have to make billions of dollars to be able to do that? Like, I promise you, um, you will just find a lot of happiness in demonstrating and exhibiting that gratitude. Mm-hmm. And so when you went to Green Bank, like, what was your, 
initial like thought what did you think it would be like nothing i actually i was like let's just go somewhere interesting there wasn't a lot of thought put behind it yeah i was like this is a thing sounds cool it's in bangladesh didn't even google bangladesh seriously like it was very naive uh, and i was still like it's not like i became less naive i remember this one time i was climbing mount fuji in japan i thought you could take a tram car up there i show up in like shorts and whatever you know at 3 p.m they're like you got to climb this thing you're not allowed to climb after 12 it was like the most naive thing didn't even like google mount fuji but we ended up climbing it and that was a crazy story um but i think yeah man sometimes like this is like part of the beauty of life is like just sometimes it's okay to be impulsive and like see where life takes you and not just being super calculated about every decision. To me, it's not about waiting for the right opportunity. It's about making right from an opportunity, mm-hmm. right? We're always in situations every single day and we got to make decisions. Even not making a decision is a decision we need to make. And so how can we just make right from whatever situation that we're in? Um, and so for me, it was like, yeah, just put myself in random situations and figure it out. And that's just all a part of the journey of life. Like, what am I optimizing for? I don't get it. Like, am I optimizing for my health? Cool. Just don't eat donuts every single day. That's probably not the right way to think about it. But, you know, it's um, a good start, though. I think most people can benefit just from that simple step. Like, that's what I tell people. I tell them, just walk, eat an apple, don't drink pop. Yeah, exactly. So there's like some of those things that that you can do where you're not like over optimizing, where you're not like, man, I just need to you know, I need to match my macros perfectly and, you know, I need to lift like X amount of time for week and then whatever. It's like, you know, 70% of the way there and I'm not a fitness guy and you are, so you can tell me this, um, but is literally just putting in the work, eating properly and yeah, like lifting heavy if you want to, depending on your goal, right? If you want to get bigger. And it's like, now the other 30% is like where you really, really optimize, but you just got to start. Mm-hmm. That was like a very, I don't even know how we got here. <laughs> Honestly, that's, that happens a lot. Like I, I go down rabbit holes and, you know, when I have a good guest who likes to go down rabbit holes with me, then we go down rabbit holes together. And so that's part of the fun. And so you come back from Green Bank and unlike, you know, your other peers who maybe went to banking or consulting or some other, you know, branded business experience, they want to do the next one. You ended up joining Next36 yeah. as one of the first cohorts. So you know, now people know about what Next36 is. Now they know it's, it's a you know very solid entrepreneurship program. But when it first came out, I can imagine that no one really knew about it. And entrepreneurship wasn't even that hot of a topic, even, you know, five, Dude, seven years ago. At the time, ago. a lot of people thought it was a scam. Because what happened was they were marketing themselves. Um, sorry, Next, guys. But this, this is what happened as a $50,000 scholarship. So everyone wanted to do this $50,000 scholarship. And they're like, actually, no, it's a $25,000 investment in the business and then $25,000 uh, development for the product that you make. A lot of people were like, oh, I don't know if I want to do this. They still attract quite a few people. Uh, but I was still like, yeah, okay, cool. That that I don't know. In my mind, it just made it also interesting. I was like, $50,000 to still spend. Like, why do people want to make money? People want to make money so they can spend money, right? So for me, um, like, for example, someone wants to be a millionaire. They don't want to be a millionaire so they can have a million dollars. They want to be a millionaire so they can spend a million dollars. It's very counterintuitive. And so for me, like when I saw this $50 thing, it's like, oh, 25 is going towards starting a business or dev work. I was like equally excited. I was like, okay, cool. That's probably better than, you know, what I would just have a regular kind of education and go through the process. And so ended up kind of jumping into that. I was one of the youngest ones. Me and my best friend at the time actually were the youngest ones in the program, um, I think. And that was a super important experience for me because it really raised my expectations of what I was actually capable of. So I was always ambitious, but I didn't know to what extent. Um, And then that was like, literally, you can conquer the world. And there was a lot of people in my cohort now, like Steve Lake was in my cohort. These are people who are a couple of years older than me, right? Who who founded Thalmic Labs in North, these like cool AR goggles, uh, you know, Michael Del Basso, who, who ran the, he was the head of machine learning at Uber, essentially. And, you know, a couple of these people who I got to see... Um, kind of grow and go through this tech thing and we always wanted to have impact right i talked about all that stuff and we deeply realized and i deeply realized at this point that tech was actually the way to have large scale impact this is the first one of the first times in human history where you didn't have to be like an albert einstein or a nikola tesla or like a conqueror of a country or something like that to actually be able to have large scale impact you can write a couple lines of code have a large scale impact right it's not necessarily about having to be this inventor and the way that we can activate. And so every single day that goes by, that becomes truer and truer. So I always had that mindset as of then, how can I combine, you know, using tech, um, but to solve really hard problems and impacting billions. And that was part of the reason 
of going down to San Francisco and then realizing there that there's a bunch of smart people working on dumb problems. Um, there's definitely pockets of a bunch of smart people working on hard problems. Um, but there was a lot more people than I thought smart people working on dumb problems and we're like, hey, we really got to we really got to fix this. I mean, there were three problems that we wanted to f- focus on um, food production, affordable housing, and then access to diagnostics and drugs, which I think, you know, I said, but I was like, you know, say we dedicate the rest of our lives to one of these problems and we completely knock it out of the park. It doesn't exist anymore. What about these hundreds of other problems that are impacting civilization? Like imagine there was a king or queen of the world, right? And imagine their main KPI was uh, optimizing for quality of life. And say every week they got a list of all the things that were adversely impacting quality of life, like disease, mental health, poverty, climate change, all that stuff. Say they're looking at this list and they're like, "Mm, I'm just going to let one of my rural subjects figure it out without any context, help, or seeing this list. That'd be a terrible decision for that king or the queen of the world to make, right? They put together a SWAT team like, you guys, focus this problem. You guys, what was this problem? Like, oh, we have a knowledge gap here. Okay, we're going to build these guys' skills and so they can focus on this problem. We're not really doing that anywhere else in, as a civilization. Like, there's no institution that's purposely developing people to solve important problems in the world. So we're like, okay, let's just do it. Hmm. And to get to that point, though, like you, after Next 36, a lot of, I think, most of the Next 36 cohorts I've met, they end up going after university. And then through that, they just go straight into entrepreneurship. But for you, you started a company for about six months and then, you know, but you were still in university and then you joined McKinsey for two yeah. years. And what what stopped you from pursuing entrepreneurship out, out of school? And dude, I was down. Year? So this is the, I was the one of the youngest ones in the program. Uh, we did our venture day. We got around like 500K in investment offers of people who are interested. And at the time, I thought that was like so much, right? A 19-year-old kid or maybe now 20 at this time. Um, and we asked our team like, hey, who wants to do this? Everyone's like, yeah, I think we'd be down to do this. But then nobody else was down to do it. Um and actually one of them was, but they were down to kind of do this in Halifax and kind of use this product for something else. And I'm like, okay, how are we going to, like, is it just me, me building this thing that I wasn't super excited about the product. I was more excited about building something mm-hmm. with an awesome team. And at that time, I actually didn't know anybody else besides my next cohort. And this is why I think next is super valuable who I'd want to do something with. Cause until then you're just with like, the people in business school and whoever else. And I was like, man, I can't really think of anybody else who do I want, who I want to do it with. So I was definitely, I would say the most down to actually take a year off or two years off and just like try and build something. Um, but then, uh, yeah, I did end up uh, joining McKinsey for a little while. And then <clears throat> I only applied to McKinsey. So it's funny now, like I only applied to McKinsey and I was like, I'm going to do it at the place where everyone thinks it's the best. And if not, then whatever, I'll just go do something else. And in my final round of the interview, the the head partner and, and the managing director for Canada is like, so you're going to stay for two years? And then I was like, well, and th- that's a throwaway question, right? Just to say like, yeah, I'm going to stay for two years. But I was like, actually, that's your job to keep me here. I was like, I might stay for eight months if I don't like it, or I might stay for 10 years. There's like no upside in me saying that. Um, it is funny because after eight months later, I did end up leaving for a period of time. And that's a whole other conversation. But then I ended up coming back for a little bit. But, uh, you know, for me, it was all about <clears throat> again, how I can use this experience uh, to really develop myself as a person. I spent a lot of time in, in Japan. So I lived in Japan for a little while, lived in Australia for a little while, got to work on things like aerospace and lithography machines and alternative energy. Um, so you never really know what the alternative could have been. Like, I don't know what my opportunity cost was, but again, it's all about making right from the opportunity. What is your existing circumstance? Now get the most out of it. And again, being thoughtful about like, what is it that I'm optimizing for? What is it that I want? To me, it wasn't money. To me, it's always about being interesting. Whatever you do, how can you just be interesting? Because the opposite of interesting is there. It's clear. You can read about it. You can see it. They're probably your friends. Like, I mean, a lot of people, this isn't like a shot. Like a lot of people just aren't that interesting to me. I don't know. Um, So how can you just be interesting? Because in your worst case, if like, say that's the bad path, the alternative is super easy to get. Yeah. I I don't remember who says it, but generally, I think the party line is, you know, successful people are interesting so just be interesting and i mean who, who which successful person ever had a story of like oh yeah i just did all the things that you were supposed to do and i ended up here and you know and a billion dollar company like, and everything went according to plan yeah that, w- that will never happen I, i've never actually like never heard a story like that there's always something that's you know interesting about these types of people um which is which is like i think a lot of people know that 
Um, but then it goes back to the courage. Like, how do you actually take that step? Right. I mean, I have a lot of friends that are working in places that they're not really excited about. And I would argue they're living their worst case scenario on purpose. Um, you know, one of my friends is, is working in a bank and you know, his dream job was to work for the MLSE. And I was like, <clears throat> why don't you work there? Um, you know, a bunch of excuses. And I was like, OK, well, we have friends that work there. They're hiring right now. Um, do you have enough money to survive for six months? He's like, yeah. So I'm like, OK, what if you spent six months relentlessly pursuing this opportunity and you failed and you went bankrupt and you don't have any money anymore? Then what would you do? He's like, I'd probably get a job back here. So I'm like, you're literally living your worst case scenario on purpose. Whereas what we should be doing is creating the best worst case scenario for ourselves, and then don't do that. Do the crazy thing because that's why the worst case scenario exists in the first place. <clears throat> oh yeah, totally. I think uh, a funny analogy that I, I, I try to make to my friends who are like I came from an accounting background, so most of my friends are still accountants, and I'll tell them why do you why do you have, why are you so obsessed of getting this accounting designation? Why are you so obsessed of getting all these ex- years of experience? And they're like, oh well, you know, so. You know, in case things don't work out, I can have a fallback. So I tell them you're literally buying a put option in your life. You think your stock's going to plummet and then you'll yeah. exercise it. Do you really want to exercise it at that point? Stop preparing for that. Actually, just go do something that you actually want. Like get a call option for you know something that's going to actually do well. For sure. Um, and so for you, like you talked about the courage to take the decision. So leaving McKinsey after about two years to go down to San Fran with your brother um, your brother was already in, in San Fran then. He was there. And by the way, to be clear, I had no idea what I was going to do there. Yeah. So <clears throat> making that jump, the plunge into the depth, like, was it orchestrated to the no. point that, you know, you're like, all right, all right, this time I'm going to go down to San Fran and figure something out. Or how did that decision process come about for you? So I just knew that I wanted to do something different because I felt like my potential was a lot higher. Like I felt like I was quote unquote, like just making the rich white dude richer, or just like which rich dude richer. It doesn't matter. Um, and so for me, I, I always felt like I was at the point where I wanted to leave and I already left eight months kind of into it. And there was something very specific that I wanted to get out of my experience that I didn't end up getting. So I was like, okay, this is the time. Can you expand on that part? <clears throat> so I wanted to work in like education in, in Saudi and McKinsey and BCG were kind of pretty much running education for that country. And there was a lot of opportunity there and I wanted to do that. And then, you know, based on my experience, they're like, oh, you can do that next time. You can do that next time. Do this, do that. And I'm like, hey, no, like enough. Like I'm not going to kind of play this game and. There were some things that happened, but uh, it was clear that I wasn't going to be able to go down to Saudi. So I was like, hey, I'm not getting what I need. I'm going to leave. Um, and I'm w- outside my building, my apartment building. <clears throat> and uh, I was like, the, the best way for me to leave is if I have no place to live. Like, this is my thought process. I was like, if I don't have a place to live or stay anymore, like, I can't work here. So my best friend at the time, he was in Dubai. He was actually working on a project at, at BCG. And I was like, yo, uh, I think I'm going to leave. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to move out. You've been talking about leaving too. Do you want to leave or do you want to stay? Because then you're going to have to find another roommate. It's gonna. I feel like this is just a thing we need to do. He's like, yeah. He's like, okay, yeah. Let's do it in two weeks or whatever. I was like, no, I'm doing it right now. <clears throat> make a commitment. Make a decision. Are you doing it? He's like, yeah, okay, fine. So I go into the leasing doors off. I knock on the, knock on the door. Uh, and I was like, hey, <clears throat> hey, I want to move out. They're like, okay, cool. Uh, here are the forms to sign. So I'm literally taking pictures of the form, sending it to my friend. He's kind of signing it remotely. And by then we're like, hey, 30 days. We have nowhere to live. Got to figure it out, right? Burn your boats. Yeah, and we had to leave. And so, <clears throat> you know, went down to San Francisco. Again, for me, like the way that I viewed it is like staying is more risky because I knew that I had a lot of potential. I wanted to be interesting. I felt like I wasn't becoming as interesting anymore. And I was just... Uh, McKinsey guy or BCG guy or whatever but even my experiences I had a lot of interesting experiences there and super grateful for a lot of the opportunities um but I was like this is literally the most <clears throat> this is literally the most exciting time in human history right and it keeps again getting truer and truer every single day with like you know back in the day we thought we had a lot of opportunities and I hear a lot of young people be like man you had way more opportunity than I do it's like dude Back then, if you were like a software engineer, that was like the next big thing. You have AI, quantum computing, nanotech, gene editing, stem cells, IoT, you know, blockchain, now Zenic Waves, which is like a crazy thing that I recently discovered. Um, there's like tons of this stuff now. Like we didn't have that back then, right? And so there's way more opportunity. And again, like the future in 15, 20 years, man, it's going to be mind blowing. Like I, the first iPhone came out 10 years ago. The internet is new. The, you know, more than half the people that exist today grew up in a world without the internet. We feel like this is super normal. Imagine them. Like, man, if I was them, I'd wake up every single day, like looking at my phone, being like, this is witchcraft. This is magic. Like, imagine how we're going to feel in 20 years. Mm-hmm. 
like it's it's very it's going to be very difficult to predict but i i don't think a lot of people understand how fast this change is going to happen but i think even more importantly they don't understand that people make that happen it's not magic 5g doesn't just happen people are working on it right and so i wanted to be one of those people who are creating my future and not just like being along for the ride gotcha and then you go to silicon valley, silicon valley you go to san fran you see what some people who are very smart are working on and you go hmm that's not really much of a big problem and so you and your brother do that a fun exercise you told me about where you imagine okay we had 10 billion dollars how would we spend it how would we fix yeah. problems what problems would be fixed and so you came upon you know food medicine and housing as like these big overarching problems and how did that like can you connect that dot with me to how TKS got formed how did you kind of disseminate all that into creating TKS now yeah i mean i said i said this a little bit earlier on the podcast but i was like what if we dedicated the rest of our lives to solve these problems and we did it what about these hundreds of other problems that are impacting billions so it st- still seems very serendipitous if someone else were to come along so like right now even the discussion so my brother and i were at marble slab literally having like i remember exactly where we were when we asked this question just seeing this self-driving car casually you know on the street uh, whereas like nobody else was talking about it here um and that discussion itself was very serendipitous. We were in a position, we were thinking about it, we were going to go do it, and what? We're just going to rely on other people to just be thinking about it, eating marble slabs somewhere, or whatever they're going to do and do it. We're like, no, we need to intentionally build these people specifically to do that. That's where we saw that as an infrastructure problem. Um, because there's a lot of, like, imagine, so I, I talked about the first part where, uh, you know, there's a bunch of smart people and they're not working on important things, but then there's a bunch of people who are born in like Minnesota, Calgary, Ottawa, wherever, where they're not biologically um, at a disadvantage, meaning that they have a lot of potential to impact billions, um, but we're just not doing a good job mining that human potential. Imagine we did, right? I think the world would be completely different. And so for us, like we just got it, like it clicked for us. And then by the way, the only reason why those three problems um, came to mind is because again going back to earlier in the podcast we deeply understood them so for example most people don't understand to the extent that food production is a problem but we were exposed somehow like for every hundred pounds of protein you feed a cow they only retain three pounds of protein that's a three percent technology where else in the world would we ever accept a three percent technology but we're doing it every single day today blindly just because nobody knows it's like the greatest magic trick in the world and we still do it but i still like eating meat so you know just how can we solve that problem in different ways and now we see like the impossible foods and we see like beyond meat and we see cellular agriculture and all these different companies trying to do it housing is another example um 60 to 70 percent of people's pre on average of people's pre-tax or post-tax income goes towards where they live the re- number one reason why people can't get out of poverty is because they don't have a way to generate wealth okay so if you're for example if you're working as like a an uber driver you know every single day for 16 hour days just to meet ends meet you're always just going to be able to meet ends meet right you you, it's very inconceivable to think you're going to get out of that because you're not generating wealth the biggest way to generate wealth is by taking like you can only make a lot of money uh if you spend a lot of money so even if you you know invested um you know ten thousand dollars but you got a hundred percent return in a year and you got twenty thousand dollars, but if you invested million a million dollars and you got a one percent return, it's the same thing, right? And so the challenge is the sixty to seventy percent of people's where they, where they can spend is going towards their housing. They don't have disposable income, the like even enough to generate wealth. And so a house is the best way for those people, in my opinion, to generate wealth. Now there are other ways to generate wealth. That's not what I'm saying for people who are a little bit more fortunate and they have disposable income. That's probably not the best. Um, investment vehicle there are other like you could put your money in the S&P and you'd make way more than you know your your housing appreciate even even in Toronto Um, but yeah okay so if that's the number one way to get out of uh, poverty then how can and the reason why people don't um, and uh, invest in generating wealth for like their house is because they rent versus buy because they can't afford the mortgage well what if you can only afford 30% of the house and 30% of the mortgage but then all the money that you're spending towards that goes towards you actually owning a piece of it. So now instead of owning 100% of a house, you own 30% of the house, but you still own it. And at the end of the day, all the money, and you're still living there. And then the other 70% is like an asset class, another asset class for other investors. Well, now we're figuring out a way to generate wealth, right? That's more on like the solution side, but the problem is there. So we, we understood that stuff that allowed us to even think of that in the first place. If you don't deeply understand problems, you're not even going through that 
decision making framework in the first place. Mm -hmm. Like we didn't understand if we didn't know those things, how could we have arrived to the this is an infrastructure problem? Because we wouldn't even be even be thinking like, okay, what are the problems we want to solve that can impact billions? It's funny, like it's it's like a deja vu moment because I think it was like last week or two weeks ago I had a conversation with, conversation with another, another another entrepreneur who's trying to solve the housing crisis by um, like securitizing with cryptocurrency. And I think he was using he wanted to use <clears throat> Ethereum as well yeah. to try to create like smart contracts. That's and, what we were doing. Yeah, like distribute ownership of the house for people <clears throat> to make it affordable as well. But for you, like you didn't end up pursuing that idea. You ended up um, working with your brother to now create TKS and. So how is that? How how was like the validation process? Like what kind of process did you guys follow to there arrive honestly, at this? There honestly wasn't. <clears throat> we were like, this problem exists. Do we trust ourselves to solve it? We literally left everything. We didn't know if it was gonna be digital. We didn't even know what it was when we started in Calgary. We're like, well, let's get the kids first, then we'll figure it out. Well, so you, so you left San Fran to go to Calgary. Yeah, to start so we went there. to Calgary, and we're like, let's just test something here. We hadn't seen our parents in a while. You know, we thought that we'd regret it if we didn't spend more time with them. So we're like, yeah, let's be in Calgary, and like while we're in Calgary, let's test this thing out. So before we even knew what the thing was to test, we got the kids first. And then we're like, we'll test it out. How'd you get the kids? Did yeah, man, it was a lot of hustling. We're like, hey, there's this cool innovation program. Like, that's all we said, right? And we just like message schools and like youth organizations. And then we're like, okay, let's build something we wished we had. Turns out that thesis was a pretty good thesis. And we just iterated on that um, as we went by. So like, that wasn't the hard part. Um, actually, like most of TK, like we ran TKS, the two of us ourselves seeing really phenomenal outcomes for two years. We just started building the team. Now we're 14 people, probably gonna be 20 people by the end of this year. Uh, in New York, Boston, Ottawa, Vegas. Uh, but until then, it was actually like literally, not literally, it was our bread and butter, right? <laughs> it's not literally our bread and butter. Um, but yeah, it just came like, it, it was so, like we deeply understood it. I think we were some of the best people in the world, honestly, to do it. And I hope that somebody else does because if someone else can crack this better than us, amazing. Like we don't need to be doing, there's a bunch of like really interesting things we can be doing in the world. I just haven't seen anyone um, really tackle this problem well hmm. like we have like Khan Academy and Udacity like we have this ed tech stuff and they focus on very specific things um, but again how do you like train people specifically to solve really hard problems in the world not necessarily just build the skills knowledge skills mindsets networks I think a lot of that is missing um, school I think is built to mitigate risk versus optimize success uh, and I think that's a problem because that just means for ambitious people literally they don't have your best interests in mind like that's just factual if they're trying to mitigate your risk versus optimizing your success and you want to optimize success that's not having your best interests in mind and that's just the way it's built um, but like for example if you want to be an olympic level basketball player you're not just going to do basketball and gym and think that that's the way to get there right there are best practices and ways if you want to be an amazing musician similarly if you want to change the world impact billions be an olympic level ceo innovator you know thought leader researcher it'd be silly to just think that oh all i'm doing in school is the only way to get there, but there was nothing that existed, like nothing in a longer term way, like in a training sense um, for people to get that. And so we didn't, and we realized that after the fact beforehand, it was a little bit naive. We were just like, oh, this doesn't exist. Let's just build it. Didn't really look at competitors or anything like that. We're just like, if we felt it, the problem must exist. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's kind of the story behind that. And so when you first started and like developed this framework, like what, what did it look like? Did you kind of preemptively say, okay, we're going to make a weekend course and we're going to work with like X many students and just try to educate, you know. Well, first it was just about... going through teenagers, like how to think and yeah, be curious. First, it was just about exposure to exponential technologies because we mm. had heard about, first of all, like I was in what, blockchain space? 20, well, I heard about it and uh, when I hear about it, 2014... Um, 2013, 2014. And then, uh, which is like, nobody was talking about it really. Um, even two years ago, like people just started hearing about it. Um, but it was still late to the party, like when I got there. Um, so that was one. And then quantum computing, we were talking about Naveed started an AI company in Toronto. Like nobody was talking about AI two and a half years ago. Like a lot of people don't understand, like the Vector Institute is new. Mila is new, right? Mars was half empty at one point. Like a lot of, like, Element AI didn't exist, right? There weren't these things that happened. It actually does happen in a short period of time. And so for us, we're like, man, like there's this, like there's a lot of these secrets in the world that don't need to be secrets. Like CRISPR, for example, like nobody was talking about this new gene editing technology. And we were like, man, it's going to revolutionize the way we live. Um, and, you know, immunotherapy with cancer. So it was like, we just had a lot of the stuff that we were exposed to. We're like, first step, let's just get people to know that this stuff exists. Mm. And then we were like, hey, that's not enough. 
then we got to focus more on the skills. We're like, okay, that's not enough. Now we got to focus on the mindsets. And then part of all that, we started getting recognized and then we started building networks. That's how we came up with knowledge, skills, mindsets, networks. Gotcha. And as you were going through this journey, like when it was just you and your brother Naveed for like the first two years, like what was your relationship with uh, fear and doubt or like resistance in general? Yeah, honestly, man, like we didn't really have a lot. I still don't have a lot. I think my big deal is broken or something like that. Seriously. Um, I'm still scared of some stuff. Like I don't want to jump off like a massive cliff or whatever. Or like, I mean, I have cliff dive, but not off like a, you know, I still get scared. And then I was on a plane one day and there was like massive turbulence from like Brisbane to like Moran, by some random city in Australia. And we dropped for like four seconds. Um, and like at that moment, I thought I was going to die. And it's so interesting. Like when you genuinely think you're going to die, what do you do? My first, th- my first thought was like, just put in headphones, play a good song and just like jam out. Um, but then I'm looking around and everybody's like completely normal. And apparently that's like a really normal thing on that flight. So I was like, so you still get scared. But I mean, for like those types of decisions, again, like all those, like so our decision making framework is like, are you healthy? Did anyone die? No, life is good. You know what I mean? Like just do stuff. What's the worst? And again, building your best worst case scenario. See, that didn't work out. What's our worst case scenario? Join as like a PM or something at Facebook or like Navi is leading the you know AI team at Box. You can do whatever he wants. Now, what's our worst case scenario? Like that's not like being a PM at Google or Facebook or whatever isn't even in my worst case scenario. It's like living on a beach somewhere, which is even worse than being a PM. Like I don't think I'd want to do that. It's probably starting another company. Um, working on inventing something i'd want to work on some like zenic wave generator and harnesser which i can talk about later but this is new technology longitudinal waves to transfer wireless electricity like these are like my literal worst case scenarios right and that happened from doing tks as well so it's just like man, do things for the right reasons create right from the opportunity and um yeah man like life isn't uh as bad as people think it is like one of my friends um he actually grew up in like pretty extreme poverty for like you know, North American standards, um, moved from Toronto to Calgary. And, uh, you know, he he had this like Toronto accent, whereas XSL clothing, all that stuff, um, family wasn't doing too well. Uh, and somehow he was going to the worst school in Calgary, somehow got uh, to university. So he's working at, he was at university. He was working two time, uh, two part-time jobs, wasn't doing well. Somehow, magically got a job at a management consulting firm and he didn't have good grades or anything like that. He just kind of did it. He was in debt, parents struggling, whatever, but his goal was to be the GM of the Raptors. Okay. Like he just loved basketball. He quit like six to eight months in, left everything to pursue this dream. Now he's in the Raptors organization, right? He's doing a bunch of really cool stuff. He's living his life. And my point here is that people like whoever tells me otherwise, like, Oh yeah, like you're fortunate, blah, blah, blah. Okay, you're right. People with a lot less, though, have done a lot more. So it just depends on what type of person you want to be. Because when I look at him, I'm like, if he can do it, and I saw him along the journey, I was like, literally, like anyone else can do it. Especially if you already have a job at, you know, as an accountant or whatever, and it's like very cushy. It's like, you can definitely do something else because your worst case scenario is you just come back and you be an, be an accountant, right? And also, people, I think, who go through that level of hardship, like, they become so dangerous, like not in like a negative sense, but dangerous in terms of their potential, like what they can do because like the amount of obstacles that they've overcome, anything else that regular life hits them, they'll be like, oh, easy, seen this before. Well, I mean, this is a Ziz Ansari joke, right? Where he's like, <clears throat> people don't struggle anymore. Um, the the probably young people's biggest struggles is going to be on a flight to from New York to LA and being like, oh, my iPad died. Like that's the joke that he uses. Um, but that's like not dissimilar. Like when do people actually get to struggle? So part of TKS is creating a lot of opportunities to fail, a lot of opportunities to struggle. Like TKS for the first couple months is very uncomfortable. You ask any of our kids that it's like, man, they're like, raising our bar for difficulty learning like phd level calculus you didn't even know what calculus was you're like some 14 year old you're like how the hell am i going to do this but when you get over that hump then you understand that anything is possible like literally you were like there's no way in your mind you're like there's no chance i'm going to build a ring that cannot invasively measure blood glucose and cholesterol levels because i don't even know what neuroscience is two years later it's happening you're raising a couple million bucks like like when you go through that, there's no way you're thinking in your head, like I can't do this anymore. So it's all about getting over that hump super early on. But the only way you can do that is if you go through some sort of struggle. And I would encourage like people who are listening, like actively seek environments and, and events of discomfort. 
because you're only learn you're only learning when you're uncomfortable. Like if you're dunking on a bunch of five year old kids on a three foot rim, you're not going to be a better basketball player, right? You got to get like stuffed by LeBron every single time. And even if you got stuffed and you never scored a basket for a year, as soon as you played anyone else, like you're going to be like, holy crap, I'm way better, right? That's the only way to do it. Um, but there's no real way right now where it's actively being imposed on a lot of people. Like people got to have enough wisdom and foresight or whatever to impose that on themselves. Yeah, I think uh, uh, it's funny. Like I, an essay I wrote, I wrote uh, this week on actual growth and vulnerability kind of touches upon this kind of analogy of how you look at a lobster, how does a you know, lobsters have strong exoskeletons, thick shells? How does it grow? It has to leave its shell. It has to go this molting process where it's soft and jelly again. And then it has to go through this period of vulnerability where it can be eaten by its own, the stuff that they used to eat and or like their own peers. And then they eventually build this skeleton, but they have to go through this period of intense vulnerability. That's where the growth actually happens. And I think that's where this discomfort will come yeah. from. You have to be in that position. And for you, like, I, you know, as I progressed through my career, like, consulting was more challenging than accounting. Hedge funds was more challenging than consulting. And this world of entrepreneurship has been way more challenging than my hedge fund job. And it's been this long period of discomfort for me. And for you, I can imagine creating TKS in the earliest, there's got to be a lot of discomfort there as you go through that part of your journey. But was it, when did that kind of, an, like, an inflection point hit? where you thought this could actually work. Like we can see this working at that point. Actually, it wasn't about discomfort or anything like that, because think about, say you're a soldier, Hmm. like say, you know, hundreds of years ago, you're like a soldier in an army. You wake up every single day and you're just a soldier. You're Hmm. not questioning like, can I do this? Is something hard? You don't even feel discomfort because that's literally your job. It goes back to the sense of duty. So a lot of people ask me, you know, oh, you're, you're scaling TKS and you're working, you know, like 18 hour days and you're in meetings. Like today I'm in meetings back for four hours straight back to back interviewing. Um, they're like, man, do you like that? And it's weird because I can't even process that. It's not about liking it or not liking it. It's my duty. I must do it. Just like, do you like pulling the kid out of the fountain? Like, it's a weird question to ask. It's like, I have to do it. It's like breathing. Yeah. And so for me, it's, it's not even like, can this happen? Can this not happen? It's, there's so much conviction, just as clear as day. Again, as I see that kid in the water, I'm like, I actually think that I can help pull all these metaphorical people out of the water. Um, and that's just what I'm going to do. Now, say someone else comes along and does it, or say I trip on my way there and I break my ankles and I can't do it. That doesn't stop the first thought in my mind. Like when I see that happening, this is what I'm going to do. Right. So it wasn't ever like, Oh, when was the point that you thought this could work or whatever? always thought so and now you get some really good indicators when these students are getting these incredible outcomes and getting recognized and working on some really interesting things um one of our kids got a job as a junior quantum engineer at rugetti they only pretty much hire from like you know uh, mit caltech stanford and like the top one percent this is 18 year old kid got a job there pretty much pioneering like quantum machine learning as it was coming out through tks when the words like qml didn't even exist and now going, and no one will ever know except for actually the projects that he was working on. If you look at the Slack, but I'm like, like he was doing it when everybody else was doing it. That's why he's there, right? And simulating molecules for drug discovery and all that stuff. I'm like, okay, asked our questions. Would this happen without TKS? It was like almost unequivocally no. And they say that too. And it's like, man, were you seeing kids before speaking at these conferences all over the world or getting internships? You know, and, and these companies wanting them to hire back instead of, you know, fourth year co-op students with like so much conviction and an excitement. And even for me, it's like, man, I sometimes like having conversations with my kids more than I do like my friends now. Right. Because like we get to talk about it in some instances, actually in a lot of instances, like we're just talking about much more interesting things. And I'm like, they're not really kids anymore. Right. It's we've, you know, accelerated them to a point where the probability of them achieving their potential is like super high and it's all been compounded, right? So this level of thoughtfulness and wisdom and the thing that they got to work on now is a bias to action because I think they're being like too thoughtful and it's almost getting to the point of like overthinking. Like overthinking and being thoughtful is not the same thing. Um, And a lot of people tend to confuse that when you're in it, right? You think that you are, but it's not. And I think they start getting to that point, but because they're getting like too existential. I think part of that is just like hormones and being, you know, a teenager or whatever. They'll get over that. Uh, and once they do, um, just having a bias towards action and iterating, like they're going to fly, man. I'm so excited to see in the next like couple of years what, what they come up with. Mm-hmm. 
And I think this is a kind of good point to kind of go through the kind of final rounds, final questions of the interview. And you, you know, your your own career as well as the kind of career you're helping your students go through is kind of followed by this theme of being intentional about taking a very unconventional path towards building kind of your life's work. And so for you, what what kind of big themes do you feel that you have a different point of view on compared to the conventional wisdom? There's yeah, a lot, but yeah. When, so one, so the one that we talked about is being interesting. So optimizing for being interesting, mm. like literally optimize. So when you have to make a decision, literally what's, what's going to make you more interesting, do that. That's like literally the extent of the decision making framework. So that's one. The second is around risk profile. <clears throat> so, you know, one of the things that I say now and Vinod Kosla, um, said this actually like two years ago at Elevate, but it really resonated with me. He says the consequence of mitigating risk makes the prospect of success inconsequential. I'll say that again. The consequence of mitigating risk makes the prospect of success inconsequential. So say you have your median bar, everything below that is risk, everything above that is reward. Everyone's trying to mitigate, 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 get closer up to the bar. But then on top, you only have a little amount of success because reward is you know proportional to risk. Um, so if you only take a little bit of risk, you can only have the potential for a little bit of re- reward. And it's like, so what's the point? What people don't realize, and this is life's biggest arbitrage opportunity, in my opinion, is that perceived risk is far greater than actual risk, but reward is directly proportional to perceived risk. So literally, if you just take more risk, more often than not, and by the way, risk isn't like jumping out of a plane without a parachute because risk implies reward. I don't really see the reward in that. But more often than not, if you take a risk, you will just be better off expected value-wise because that's just the way the world works. Until everyone catches up, you know, and closes this perceived risk, actual risk, you know, gap, this is your time. Like, just do it. Um, now, a lot of people won't because, again, not having that courage, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then the, the third thing that I would say is um, optimizing for finding a third eye. So someone, like, we should not trust ourselves for a lot of things. Humans are like the best, the best superpower we have is being able to self-rationalize anything. We can make anything make sense. And just having this third eye to just be like, hey, what you're doing right now is dumb or like you made a mistake here or you should actually do this. And without any hesitation, just trusting that. Don't say anything back. Just shut up and do it. Right. So my brother's my third eye uh, and I'm his third eye. And then I think everyone else should just get their third eye so they can just, you know, figure out like an outside in approach. Like what are the best ways to to kind of live? I think if you do those things, man, we don't need to like over optimize everything, right? As long as you have like good intentions and, you know, you're willing to have a growth mindset and all that stuff, like life's good. You'll be fine. But it really depends what you want. If you want to be ambitious and stuff like that, then quit whatever you're doing, do something else because you're probably living your worst case scenario on purpose. I love that. I love all three of those. And like, especially the second one, it's just, it's just basic investing one-on-one. You want a, a, a symmetric payoffs, just yeah. heads I win, tails I don't lose much. It's just simple. And then the last question is, if the 20-year-old Nadim were to look at you right now, so he's probably like third year in Western or something, and saw what you're doing, what do you think that Nadim's emotional reaction would be? He'd be be? like, obviously, yes, (laughs) this makes the most sense. Like, I really think like 20-year-old, like, you you didn't know that, but if he was like, oh, this is what you're doing right now? Yeah, like 100%. That's so Nadim. If I was like, if I was working at Goldman or something like that and I was like in a suit every single day, like he'd be like, what? Like, I hate this person. And I mean, I can't believe he like succumbed to the system. Um, so I definitely have like a lot of the similar basic attitudes and mindsets and all the stuff of being unconventional and making the best of every scenario and being interesting and all that stuff. So I don't think he'd be surprised. You get a, you give yourself like a slow clap. Yeah. yeah I think so. I'd be like, yeah, I want to be that guy. I think so. I don't know. That's yeah, I'd say. that's good. And so then is there anything today that we didn't talk about that you kind of uh, wish we did? Man, or... there's there's tons of what I what would have been interesting <laughs> to talk about is actually like all the stuff that's happening from an ep- exponential tech perspective. Mm. Um, what's cool now is after doing TKS is like I could have a really interesting conversation and I have with like, you know, experts or PhD level people in AI, blockchain, quantum computing, nanotech, all that stuff. And what's actually happening in the world is way more advanced than people think way more advanced. I think most people understand that most like, you know, plugged in people understand that for AI and there's a lot of videos on that and you see like alpha zero and like blah, 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 what they're able to do. Um, 
but not a lot of people are thinking about that for nanotech. Like, okay, so when we think about innovation and exponential technology, there's two ways to categorize innovation. There's pre-inflection point. There, well, it's three ways, I guess. Pre-inflection point, inflection point, and post-inflection point, like things that have already happened. I think AI is post-inflection point, okay? Um, I think blockchain, we might have felt as post-inflection point. I actually we're, think we're getting... We're at the inflection point when we build a lot of these infrastructures and whatever. Like, how can we actually be useful here? Um, IoT, from a grand scheme of things, from a market perspective, I think we're at an inflection point. Man, no one's talking about how we're going to have sensors in everything, like literally everything, all the data that we're going to get from that. How do we capture that data? What is that infrastructure? Now, pre-inflection point is quantum computing. Mm -hmm. We're not there yet. What else is pre-inflection point? Fusion. I think that's pre-inflection point. People aren't really talking about fusion right now. Most people don't even know the difference between fusion and fission. This is a really interesting company coming out of MIT right now that might have cracked the plasma problem better um, than like ITER and some of these most these other fusion companies or like K Star or whatever. And, <clears throat> and it's public, by the way. Well, it's not public. Like you, the website is there, and you can see what they've been working on. But not a lot of people know this, and I have so much confidence uh, in this company. Um, nanotech is another one pre-inflection point we talk about graphene and carbon nanotubes and all that stuff years and years ago how come everything's not made out of graphene the biggest reason why is because of nanofabrication we actually don't have a good way to develop graphene and other nanomaterials oh we're making a lot of progress there now right again not a lot of people are talking about it Zenic waves this is something that i discovered so nikola tesla built the wardenclyffe tower with the intention of trying to transmit wireless electricity <clears throat> to everywhere in the world and uh, no one actually disproved it. It was like one of those things, like you can look up a lot of literature on it. A lot of people say like, oh, it won't work because we don't know if longitudinal waves exist. Um, and there's a company trying to do it in Russia and a company trying to do it in uh, Houston, Texas. And uh, because they're like, nobody really figured this out. We recently discovered a year and a half ago that Zenic waves do have longitudinal uh, properties where you can actually transfer energy. And you know, like those Tesla... Um, type orbs where you like touch it and then you know like the electric shock will go to your finger but it actually doesn't shock your body um, there's something called the skin effect there so the electricity is actually going through you but it's going on top of your skin it's, it's not very invasive so Zenic, the idea behind Zenic waves is what if you can transfer electricity just on the earth's surface hmm. anywhere in the world um, and like it's when the more I look into it like you, you think it's crazy uh, at first but the more I look into it I'm like huh, you know, like I, I'm not an expert in it or whatever, but like these are some of the things that like, that's like pre, pre-inflection point that nobody's like, I, I I actually don't know anybody who knows anything about Zenic waves. That's something I recently discovered and I'm interested to learn about it more. Um, but man, from like an exponential tech perspective, so many things, induced pluripotent stem cells, like this is the type of stuff, like a whole other podcast we could like dance all day on. Induced pluripotent stem cells is essentially you can take, take any cell, turn it into a stem cell. Right, we all know how important stem cells are. The problem is, is that we could only typically get it from embryonic cells. That's not a scalable way for you know to make stem cells. But what if you could make a skin cell? So induce a skin cell into a stem cell. The problem right now is, for every hundred cells we do that for, again, there's something about this three percent thing. Only three percent of cells actually are induced into stem cells. Mm -hmm. What if there was a made way to make that better for cancer treatments, for you know neurotherapy, like all this stuff? Completely changes the game for rejection of organs like making organs from scratch, like 3d printing uh organs like you know a lot of people are talking about mad like this is the stuff that i could dance like all day and talk about all day and i'm guessing is this is this the stuff that you're reading about just day and night it's just fuel for you yeah i mean the, <clears throat> like this is the curriculum at tks right? right and then a lot of these students are going into these things and they're teaching us this stuff right. like this is why i think it makes it the most interesting job in the world because our job is to learn um, to you know, deliver the curriculum, and then our jo job is to learn again, helping them problem solve how to get to the next step. But they got to teach us at and, that point, right? So it's really like crowdsourcing knowledge. Um, yeah, like I, you know, again, how can we use exponential technologies as tools to solve really important and hard problems in the world? Like that's that's the foundation of TKS. It's not just about impacting billions, because it's how do you do that? Again, thousands of years ago, the way to do that is through revolution or invention. Um, now you can start a company. You can work with a top tech company and impact billions. You can also do research. You can, you can do all these things. And there's a lot of stuff being happened where we can crowdsource, you know, happening where we can crowdsource this knowledge because, you know, back then without the internet, it was so hard to access this knowledge. Like you had to go to a library. Now you can be like a seven-year-old kid reading research papers if you want, 
like if you want you might not be able to understand it but you can you have the ability before you couldn't right and i don't think i think a lot of people are underestimating like how fast the world is going to change and how much potential is just being untapped and you know as we continue to expand tks and stuff i really think that these young people are going to be the next generation of people who impact billions and hundreds of millions and you know improve the quality of life and like that's really our ethos here right it's not about some like cute kids boot camp type of thing like this is our goal if we don't get there we're going to do something else mm -hmm. um but so far so good yeah i think uh you know naval ravikant talks about how the problem isn't the availability of resources it's the actual desire to learn and it seems like you're doing a great job manifesting that inside these young students yeah 100 percent. um and, you know, this was amazing i had a lot of fun talking Sweet. about it and yeah i think you know given the kind of philosophies you have and knowledge you have we could definitely do hours of conversation yeah. <laughs> um but yeah maybe for our next time sounds good man thanks yeah, thanks for coming to the podcast all right thank you for listening to the podcast i hope the story was inspiring to you it hopefully it also helped you expand your perspectives hopefully it also made you question the default path that you might have been going on or the default beliefs you might have had. And maybe now it'll make you even think about doing something about it, doing something different maybe, challenging yourself, being courageous. Who knows? But regardless, I'm really happy that you took some time out of your day to listen to this fantastic story with my guest. And if you would like to somehow, in some way, contribute and help support the podcast and maybe even just be part of the community that I'm trying to build with the greater OMD Ventures platform, really think about being a stakeholder in the platform. And the quick way to do that is to go to my website, oldmandan.com and go to the stakeholders page. I believe it's oldmandan.com slash stakeholder. And the link is also down below. And that's how you can figure out how you can subscribe, follow to get more updates on the free content. But at the same time, also donate and donate by actually just buying me a coffee that's just how i put it and you can buy me a coffee a month coffee a week or coffee every day of the year and think about it as the way that you know if you wanted to chat with me you might just bring me out for coffee and buy me a coffee or if you wanted to bring one of my guests out to chat you might buy them a coffee so i'm just think of it as i'm the service that's doing that for you so you can just pay me in coffees <laughs> don't worry uh everything will still be free it's just it would just really help if you would like to show your support this way so that I can use the coffee money to buy myself actual coffees and also to buy my guests actual coffees at and use the leftover money to actually grow the platform as well as even keep it operationally alive as well because it all this is, isn't really free and it does take a lot of time to build it as well as operate it and hopefully grow it further so your support would be amazing if you would like to contribute and so yeah just check out the website go to the stakeholders page and read the different kind of benefits you might even get as a stakeholder all right thank you